So we, we've alluded to this question, although I don't know that uh, I've pinned anyone down, but you know, I mean, we have these now five different options that are available, um, and we've kind of talked about them um, in the context of, of bringing up these different biologics, but what are the factors that help us to identify which patient might be an optimal, optimal candidate for a Zolair, uh, Zolair or Malazumab versus an anti-IL-5 therapeutic, um, of which there are three, versus dupilumab, um, and, and how do we define that? So I, th I think one thing we did not really talk a lot about is differentiation between the three anti-IL-5s that are available. Uh, and, you know, obviously, mepolizumab was the first to be approved. It's a once a month uh, uh, approved for uh, age 12 and above and Fixed subcut dose. subcutaneously. Right. Uh, and then um, reslizumab just came next, and it's an intravenous weight-based. Mm -hmm. There's some data suggests maybe an obese patient may work better. There are no one has to say there are no head-to-head -head studies comparing any of these, uh, or five of them. Uh, there are some uh, like analysis and meta-analysis, but again, uh, it's very hard, and I think one has to be very cautious about comparing one versus the other. The patient populations are different, uh, and then uh, Reslimzumab approved 18 and above uh, intravenous infusion. And then um, penrolizumab is a bit different. It targets the IL-5 receptor. Mm -hmm. um, hypothetically, it has a better effect on eosinophil uh, um, death, but again, no head-to-head -head studies. And, and the, the drug is given every month for the first three months, but then every eight weeks. So that may have an advantage in a way that it doesn't have to be given every month, and it's subcutaneous. Um, so having said that, you know, there, the patient's preference is important. I know Brad and I worked on uh, a shared decision-making tool with the American College of Allergy, Immunology, and CHEST, and it's online right now, uh, which is, I th well, obviously I'm biased. I think it's a very important tool for patients to know about, especially if you have a patient that has overlapping features, allergic, eosinophilic, where there's more than one choice. Uh, patients can go in and read about uh, these biologics so that they understand what they're stepping into. So the ro route of administration, the frequency, uh, where to give it, the cost, the insurance coverage, where the patient has eosinophilia. I think in patients who have no eosinophilia and allergic asthma, no question, omelizumab remains the, uh, the choice right now. In those with high blood eosinophils, and you can argue what is high, in general 300 and above, but some people believe 150 and above, then there's more than one choice. And in oral corticosteroid dependent asthmatics, you know, there's more data to favor the anti-IL-5, anti-IL-4 than, uh, than the omeluzumab. So all these have to be factored in uh, when you decide. Um, and patients uh, obviously has also a, a role to so you had mentioned, I, I think those are all absolutely the points that I consider. You had mentioned also comorbidities, and I've seen some posters here at the, the Quad AI that talk about this a little bit. But um, Low-hanging fruit, of course, for atopic dermatitis, which is obvious. That would lead you, to, lead you toward a 413, trying to inhibit that axis. Nasal polyps, probably 413, although the anti-L5s and probably mumblizumab have some effect on nasal polyps. And it clearly, if you got her to carry you, you would probably might mitigate toward uh, omelizumab as, a, as a, a treatment option in those kinds of patients. But I think that uh, the eosinophilic signal in the, in the airway compartment is most effective, as Nick said earlier, by the IO-413 mm -hmm. uh, molecule. And that's what, if that stays persistent, because it's not affected so much by the IO-5s, that you might want to use that as a, as a therapeutic option. Oh, one thing one has to keep in mind with uh, dupilumab, uh, although the clinical relevance is not known, but eosinophils tend to go up early mm -hmm. on after administration. Uh, I think in the clinical trials, it was not of any consequence, but in real life, whether that would be in patients with very high blood eosinophils, you know, whether that would be uh, of concern, we still don't know. It's still, a, it, it may be a trafficking problem mm -hmm. with the attacks and being the primary creditor of that. And it tends to go back to, as you said, to the baseline by 16 weeks. But it actually tells us, I'll come back to your question in a minute about how we choose. It tells us something about the biology. Mm -hmm. It teaches us. 
you know, uh, we think of the, you asked about the biomarkers, pheno and eosinophils, and you might think of them trending together. Here's a clear example where they go in the opposite direction. Unexpectedly the opposite direction. Yeah. yeah. And so we have stuff to learn. In terms of how you choose, the data is not there, obviously. We, we choose based on our experience. We've had some for a long time, some are new, patient preference, some of the issues that Nick mentioned about whether eosinophilia is a, is a big issue, um, and the comorbidities. And I think we'll all do it differently. Eventually, over time, it'll become clear to us. But in terms of providing guidance to our colleagues, I think we don't have the tools the, to provide the, that guidance. The one, the one thing that I would be very cautious about is switching quickly. You know, I think once a decision is done on a biologic, like I have, I can tell you from my experience, I have a patient who's already tried three of them because she, she wants, she wants an immediate she wants response. An immediate response. And that's not going to happen. Well, well, some response may happen, like lung function improvement with some of them, but to give a chance for the biology to work, you know. You, you know, think 16 weeks is okay or do you want longer? Uh, well, some data from Olizumab from Europe suggests 16 weeks mm -hmm. is, is good enough. Uh, that's three months, I think, at least three months, yeah. I would say. Three Maybe to six, six months. months. And I think if you look at the clinical trials, um, you know, although they're in an optimized situation, you know, the phase two, the th phase three trials, they're, we're talking about 24 to 52 weeks, right? And so, uh, 48 year. weeks, right? So, I mean, I think somewhere three, six months is a reasonable sort of yeah, approach, so, and you should. I think 16 weeks, four, which is four months, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> My math is not good yeah. <laughs> this morning. So, four months is pretty good. Some suggestion from your, the UK with MEPO, they suggest even one year treatment. Yeah. But it's hard to believe that patients are not responding. Uh, in in a year, that th they will continue right. getting injections. I think, especially if they're having exacerbations, you're not able to sort of see the improvement right. in lung exactly. function, etc. Then I think you might see that's to the problem with these biologics. Well, it's not a problem; it's really a a, a challenge. Is how do you know if they're responding? Mm -hmm. And where you biomarkers know. would be nice if we had predictive biomarkers and biomarkers that changed with therapy. So yeah, blood eosinophils go down with anti L fives. Uh, uh, certainly, the pheno doesn't change with anti-alphas, but it does go down nicely with anti-L4s. We've shown some data now recently with omeluzumab. Some of these biomarkers go down. IgE doesn't change, as you know. Um, but uh, there are some tools, like clinical assessment tools. They're very subjective. Yeah. <laughs> but I think um, it, it brings up a very important point that the patients who were studied in whom these drugs appear to be effective were clearly an exacerbation-prone phenotype. We all have severe asthmatics who have chronic symptoms, maybe not two exacerbations a year, in whom we try these drugs and then we say, are they working? It's very difficult to know because with the exception of dupilumab, lung function change was not a big feature of these drugs. Um, Res daily Lizumab. symptoms. Were Res had a pretty good yeah, I think the change. three, Resla, yeah. Benrel, and, and Dupilumab all had decent, yeah. varying yeah. degrees at different time points. But, but so, so the patients we choose, we talk about choosing biomarkers to guide us. I think the clinical pattern is equally important in guiding us. If it's not an exacerbation, exacerbation prone phenotype, just chronic symptoms, that's going to be hard to show. PROs are what patient reported outcomes are what right. patients want to see. They right. want to feel right. better. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, so it's, it's hard to judge. But I think, I mean, I have certainly had patients in whom um, mepolizumab appeared at three months to be not really doing much. But then by six months, this had turned around. So, so I don't, I think it's a maybe six months might be better than three before we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Especially if you're treating a patient through the summer months when their right. asthma is likely to be more quiescent during that time that you really do need six to get to the fall to see how things are going.